Okay, we've got a lot of wires here, but that's because the plane's not finished and they're not bundled up yet. Now, what we are going to look at is the location of the heating system in the S19. As you can see, in front of us, we have the rudder pedals. And over on the other side, we have another set of rudder pedals. Then in the middle, there is a passage. And it's not a very big passage, but it's a big enough passage that we can mount two firewall pass-throughs on the bottom, all the way at the bottom, and those will have our fuel injection hoses that are eventually going to end up right here at our six-port fuel valve that we need for this low-wing airplane. So that's the fuel injection hose that's being used for that, and I just wanted to cover that at the same time while I'm underneath here. So what you're seeing is uh, pass-throughs in the firewall. Those pass-throughs are available in the Viking shopping cart. All this stuff that you would need in order to do a proper installation, you can either find on your own or you can just buy the whole grab bag from Viking and use it. Now, what you're seeing here is the heater installation itself. And it is just vertically mounted, right between the rudder pedals, right above the fuel hoses, and it goes straight up to the top. And a couple of braces put on it just to hold it using the airframe structure. So now what you do as far as going through the firewall is to drill the proper size for the hose that goes on there and you push the hose a little bit too far so it goes in through the hole that seals up the hole and then you put the clamp on the outside for the hose that goes to the engine and you just make sure that, that those clamps are on the inside of the barbed area and you tighten them down and make sure that they are snug and it can never come off. Now since we're talking about the heater as you can see we have the uh, through fitting right here and we're running the supplied hose that comes with the Viking heater and we run it through here and conveniently comes right through here and over to the fitting on the Viking engine that accepts the heater return. This means the hot liquid has already passed through the heater from the bottom up and is now being returned into the Viking engine on top. Now uh, we are carefully of course tying this away from the pulley. There is enough clearance but we're also using a tie to hold it away from the pulley. Now on the bottom we have a similar situation where we have added a fitting because this is the location of the engine that the liquid is hot, meaning that it has already passed through the Viking engine. It is now warm and it can be used for heat or it can be, of course, routed through the radiator if uh, it is ready to be cooled and brought back to the engine. But of course, we don't want to cool the liquid that is going to be used to heat the cabin. So we're putting in these fittings that come with the Viking heater we're adding the hose and we're making sure that we support the hose along its run with the proper ADAL clamps and there are holes provided in the engine for that. Uh, what you want to do is get some 8 by 1.25 millimeter thread uh, bolts and ADAL clamps. There are ADAL clamps available with larger holes in them which is what you want because the standard style will have smaller holes and you won't be able to use the bolts that is required to hold the clamp into the engine. Now of course we don't use zip ties up against the engine mount because of chafing and possible wearing into the engine mount so we're using ADAL clamps everywhere. We're supporting our holes there and we're coming back to the location where it enters the firewall which then will be right above the nose wheel and right below where the coolant is entering back to the engine. So a very simple installation of the heater. Uh, next thing you'd have to do of course is install the switch for the heater and you wire that according to the diagram on the website that shows you that you will wire it in a fashion where the fan number one is on when you go to one position and both fans are on when you go to the other position. That way you can regulate the amount of heat. Let's talk about the cooling system on the Viking engine that you have, that you're installing. What you've got is, of course, a liquid-cooled inline engine, and you have a coolant pump 
this is what this pulley back here it drives the coolant pump notice how I don't see say water cooled because we don't use water we would use NPG coolant uh, and that's all that's approved in the engine because we don't run any pressure in the cooling system so here's your fill port and uh, we're going to cover this system from here and then moving in the direction that the coolant flows which is um, fill it here and coolant is in the engine and the pump is pumping it throughout the engine now the coolant is then pumped through the engine itself through the block and then it goes back and forth and then it goes into the cylinder head and it cools the cylinder head which of course is very hot because it has the valves the exhaust valves and so forth and so on and when it's all done cooling all this it exits over here which is the front pilot side of the engine now as you can see this is also where we have our coolant temperature probe uh, handily so because it is the hottest part of the engine and that's what we want to know how hot is the engine at the hottest place also at that point we have our thermostat located the thermostat has the job of either and as we can see this engine from the front you will see that there's a loop there you see up above the gearbox there's a tube and down below is the radiator well guess what when the engine is cold all of the coolant that exits the engine does not have to be cooled by the radiator so all of the coolant will go through this bypass and it just goes right back goes to this chamber where we have uh, right now there's some air in it because we haven't run this engine yet and then that and that chamber is full of coolant and it is then hooked back into the coolant pump which pumps it around again so that's one way that it will go now as you're taxiing out on your pre-flight and you're going up to the runway you are going to as by habit watch your coolant temperature probe as you're on your instrument and you'll see as it goes through 180 182 degrees that the needle on your instrument or would start to drop or your numbers and it drops back down to 165 170 what is happening is you are actually seeing the thermostat opening by an, in an indirect way you can see that the thermostat is opening it is closing this passage all the uh, coolant is now rushing down and it's going through the radiator it's being cooled by the propeller airstream going through and then it goes back up here and it goes to say ends up in the same place so this is how you can tell that your thermostat is working and that the system is doing what it's supposed to do now you get to this side of the engine you have a tank this is a, a kynar tank which is about the best plastic that you can have as far as being able to not absorb hot glycol, lasting a long time, ozo, ozone friendly, and on and on and on. So it is a good product. Uh, it is mounted by these screws in the back. And it's also bonded to it underneath here. And it is held to the engine with a clamp back here. So if this is all mounted correctly and it is not strained in any way, this will last for a long time. Now you also notice that we have some smaller hoses exiting both the tank and this coolant tower as we call it uh, right above where the heater return was and we have our fill plug here well we also have a hose and this is an important one from the cylinder head over here remember this was the hot part and we want to bleed any kind of air that is in the system here off of the head and that hose also runs back through here and it just happens to come around and it tees into all this stuff here and the reason for that is that so we have multiple locations on the engine we can bleed off any air that doesn't do any good for the cooling and then we go to our expansion tank over here and you will see uh, as the engine is running that this level mark will be higher when it's hot and lower when the engine's cold and you'll get familiar with what is supposed to be um, of course having a halfway mark is a good thing uh, when it's cold and then uh, that gives you a little bit of expansion room for when it heats up there is a uh, uh, cap on here and it is vented uh, if you did receive one that where the top hole was not drilled out then you can put an 18 inch hole in it and uh, then uh, that provides the vent for the whole system so that air can in fact escape and get back into the system now you fill your NPG coolant right here. Take this cap out, screw a plastic funnel in here is what we usually do. And we fill it up and we're not able to get it 
100% full right away. So what we do is we run it a few times and the engine will take coolant from the tank as it needs it and eventually this will be all full after the engine has gone through some cycles of heating all the way up and cooling down and heating up because each time it heats up it pushes air out of the system and draws coolant back into the system after it's shut down. Now of course uh, the engine even though it's liquid cooled cannot run on one liquid alone so we also have to have an oiling system. The, oils, the oil as far as where you are going to service the engine there's an oil filler uh, cap right here and this is also your breather cap. This cap uh, is removable. You pull that off and then now you have access to where you will fill the oil. You also have a dipstick on the engine. It's located right here like a normal dipstick. Pull that out and uh, look at the oil. You're supposed to be between the dotted lines on the engine and uh, then you would fill uh, or drain depending on if you already put too much in. Keep in mind that after you run it for the first time the um, oil will uh, be lower because you're filling the oil cooler, you're filling the engine and uh, you might have to put more in after the first run. Now this part is a replaceable part. It is a filter. It has a, a matting in here. It is your breather filter. What it does is take crankcase vapor from the engine. Uh, it puts it into this and collects the vapor, uh, lets the or collects the oil, lets it drain back into the oil tank, and then uh, puts the vapor overboard. Now, even though this does a pretty good job of collecting this uh, oil mist or this vapor, uh, the oil will still have minuscule amounts of oil in it. Hence, the installation of this oil hose from here running down into yet another little canister and that's just to keep the belly of the airplane 100 percent clean now what we've got here is we can't just run this nice big hose that letting the engine breathe into a canister and put a cap on it because that's where the breathing would stop so what we're doing is we're using the same type of canister we are providing an exit as well as an inlet there's the inlet and then we made, we bent a 5 8 piece of Versa tubing into a 180 degree bend. And uh, we ran that around and we just put that onto a ADAL clamp over here and then ran it overboard. And of course, uh, you know, if you want to do uh, one better than we did is you can even make this bigger. You can let this thing go as far up on the firewall as you want, make the bend and then come back down. Uh, anything like that would help as far as condensing oil out of it and leaving it in the tank. But this is a very nice system. Now, so you would put in the uh, uh, 5W20 oil that's required to the middle of the marks on the dipstick. You can use regular dinosaur oil. You can use Mobile One synthetic. But you cannot use synthetic oil when you are flying with 100 low lead fuel because the two are not compatible. So you would just use regular oil if you're going to use 100 low lead. 100 low lead can be used on occasion. That might be another liquid to talk about and that is the fuel. You want to use the me medium or high grade fuel, not 87, so 89 or 92. Um, and that would be ideal. Ideally without alcohol, but that's, you know, that's not a really a big deal. I'm just saying that it gives you more power. So that's the fuel that you would use. If you're out traveling, you can use 100 low lead fuel and uh, you would wash that back out just simply by using car gas when you got back home. If the engine is going to be stored for any length of time, you might want to consider putting 100 low lead in one fuel tank or just putting it in and uh, even if you have some car gas left, fill it up with 100 low lead because, and then run it through the engine because it's an excellent fuel stabilizer type of fuel. It's very stable and it will keep your injectors and fuel lines and all that stuff in better shape than if you ever were to leave the plane with car gas just sitting there for several months, turning the car gas into bad varnish, uh, collecting in your injectors and so forth. So that's the fuel that you would be running. Um, one thing that you can do when you're on a cross-country running 100 low lead is you can add Marvel Mystery Oil 
as per directions on the can. You can get that right at Walmart, I believe. Uh, and that will coat the cylinders just enough that the lead that is dispensed from the 100 low lead will not stick to the airframe and to the internal engine parts. So that covers the fuel and the oil and your coolant. The NPG coolant, by the way, is available from, from us, and it's also on Evans Coolant website. And uh, now moving to another fluid, another oil source. You need gearbox oil. So what you're gonna do is get a 100 milliliter. We're saying milliliter here because it does say right on the bottle what that is. We also have on our website what that is in ounces, but it's not very much. And this other plug up here is your fill plug for your gearbox oil. As you can see here, there's a oil window or an inspection window. And you would fill it until it is half full. Now, if you fill it and you're not careful, then before you know it, it's too full. And too full or too much is not a good thing. It's not that more is better. That's not the case with a gearbox because gearboxes will tend to run hotter with too much oil. They build up too much more pressure with too much oil. And uh, it's all around just not needed. Uh, you will drain the gearbox on occasion. And that drain is right here. You can see this cutout right underneath the propeller. Of course, with the spinner on, this doesn't have a spinner. You're going to have to go in from the side to be able to get to this and then drain it. And then you might want to make yourself some kind of a cup that collects the oil without getting it down onto the uh, shroud of the oil cooler because I don't know if you're familiar with gear oil but it is pretty nasty. It smells and it gets on stuff and it's hard to clean up so if you can keep it off your airplane and keep it off the uh, engine parts that would be preferable. That covers the gearbox and we don't have any other fluids. Uh, the, other, the only other thing that you want to make sure of is for instance when you mount the cowling that you do make a little hole so that you can see this or if you have a door over here on your cowling that you have an inspection mirror available in your airplane where you can see the level.